All right, guys, welcome to yet another exciting episode of Basic Kabbalah. So today, I, you know, it was funny. I wanted to do this whole thing where, you know, in a world, the gods of the tarot, because it's like, you know, like the gods of Egypt, but you could do a whole movie, the gods of the tarot, you know, and just do that whole thing because it's fun and you're supposed to have fun with this. Um, in fact, when we talk in the advanced studies course about the major arcana card of the devil, you, you'll see what I mean. But that we take things far too seriously, like literally, and that a, a portion of it that we often miss when dealing with Kabbalah, <clears throat> which can be by itself a really super dry topic, which in and of itself is funny when you think about it, right? You know, but um, it is it's supposed to bring you joy. Like that's the the end thing, like all this the purpose. If if I'm asked, I'm, I'm like this is supposed to bring you joy, yeah, in the end. And the joy comes from um, an informed relationship with the divine. Like you get to peek a little bit and go, oh, this is how it works. And because of that, that initiates the first stage of communion. Because understanding that lets you get to the next stage, which totally brings us into today's topic, which is the gods of the tarot so anyway um i couldn't help myself you guys it's been a wonderful weekend so let's share a screen here and uh <clears throat> so here we are uh you guys can see that well enough right okay so you'll notice in each sphere of the tarot which could be interpreted as a kind of crossroad because more than one path crosses into that right so in each sphere, you, you get this astrological symbol of a different Roman god. Um, and each symbol then represents that god in that sphere. And, and that can inform you a great deal about the sphere in general, simply by using that principle of correspondence that we talked about previously. So if I wish to understand, let's say, the sphere of Gevura, right here, number five, and I see that the Mars is the primary actor there, he is the avatar of that sphere, the god of that sphere, then understanding the nature of Mars as he plays out in mythology and different stories will help me understand the sphere of Gevura. It kind of personifies it. But the real question isn't, hey, let's go through all these spheres and I'll break down what gods they are. And, and we can talk about, you know, Jupiter and Mercury and Venus and the moon and all that. That comes later. <clears throat> the real question is, what is a god? Um, or, or actually, the first question, <laughs> more than any other, are they real? Are the gods real? We've touched on this a little bit in my advanced studies course, but that's definitely a question that you need to ask yourself. Now, coming from a multiple esoteric background where I was part of lots of different communities, so in my Wicca stage, obviously, there's <clears throat> a whole lot of uh, uh, different divinities that are approached, right, when you're in Wicca. And if you happen to... Uh, uh, follow Asatru and be in a Gorseth, you know, which is this Nordic religious thing and, and participate in that, then there's a whole bunch of others. But they're always approached as if they're actually there, right? That's usually the mindset is that they're there. And then the question is, well, what are they? Like, really? Like, are they things that interacted with us? Or is that just a story? Who is the first person to think about gods? And then what did they do? And then what makes a God stronger and what makes a God weaker? Like these are all different, different kinds of things to consider when considering this question of are the gods real? And <clears throat> let me tell you, this gets personal. Like people get really personal because what they'll think, they'll say to themselves, <clears throat> Well, no, all the mythological gods are pure fantasy. However, my God's real. Like everyone does that. They yeah. all do it, right? So when the Catholic Church rolls into the New World and they're approached with priests of Quetzalcoatl, right? And 
and they're all like hey this is our god and the priests are like wow that seems familiar because it is and and then they're like well you know what your god actually isn't the god god let me give you our god which has many of the same traits and then we'll kind of bundle all this together but what are they actually doing okay so now that i've like laid all these questions out and got you going hmm, i don't know are the gods real are they not the the actual answer is yes and no they are real but they're not real so then the question is what are they composed of well in Dion Fortune's text, she gives us a little bit of insight here. So I'm going to be quoting from that just to help us along here. It's in uh, on page, if you happen to have the Mystical Kabbalah by Dion Fortune, that'll be cool. Otherwise, you'll have to work with me. In this half light, it's always difficult for me to read, so you'll have to apologize. If I have too much light. Let's see. Let's see how this works well that works okay so so this uh, what is created then I'm going to come to the text in a minute I want to preface this so then what is a god when we are approached collectively as mankind with certain existential things that we have to deal with like the nature of a day or the power behind a harvest or the power behind childbirth or the nature of death it helps us as human beings to package these things which can be both beneficent or traumatic into a countenance that we can comprehend and because we are beings that speak in symbolic terms constantly constantly we are always and forever using that um and and uh in, in our language anytime we get meta about anything we're using symbolism to reveal other meaning right in other things we're talking you know if you're you're talking about a particular show and it was like that then immediately someone has to have a common background in the experience our predecessors our forefathers living in this environment must have experienced some sort of cognitive awakening that made them aware of their environment and also their relationship with it in order for them to deal with it like let's say deal with the nature of a thunderstorm and lightning strikes right they began to develop characteristics formative characteristics with language and description to provide a house a home a temple whereby these forces of nature could then be embodied and sold it's it's why my biggest gripe with contemporary religious thinking is that it's not specific enough to yield salvation meaning if you don't have a set of rules of conduct that align your vibration in such a way so that your behavior would induce communion with the force that you wish to communicate with so if i seek communion with a being of pure light then i can't just with my mouth flap around as isaiah and draw nigh unto them with my mouth but leave my heart far from them okay the heart has to go with the mouth and in that sense, the heart is representative of your inner will, your innermost desire. So if you seek communion with those forces, it must be a product of your innermost desire as well as those forces. So looking at Dion Fortune's work, then she's describing this on the previous page, this process. Then in section 11, she says, in order to achieve this end, he builds up in his imagination a mental picture intended to represent the being that is the presiding genius of the natural phenomenon he wishes to come to term with. A genius is the, the intellectual entity that, that ex exists there. <clears throat> he builds it up repeatedly. He adores it. He prays to it. He invokes it. If his invocation be sufficiently fervent, the being he is seeking will hear him telepathically and may become interested in what he's doing. 
So what we're talking about is we are here on the material plane. We are in Malkut. And we are creating something. Something for a being that exists within the astral plane. Within Yetzirah. So that incorporates the forces of the seventh sphere of Netzik, which is which is the force of all this, the, the material sphere of Hod, which provides the structure, and the sphere of Yesed, which provides the rhythmic foundation. Things can come into being and they can cease to be. In the, in the case, as um, she continues, and says, <clears throat> gradually, it may become tamed and domesticated. I, I think that's interesting, the idea of taming and domesticating an astral entity. Um, and finally, it may be persuaded to ensoul from time to time the form that has been built up out of the mind stuff for its vehicle. Mind stuff is language. That's what mind stuff is. So if I say that this divinity which I am creating <laughs> is unchangeable, right? That that it is eternal, um, it, it gives you the entire reason behind the Council of Nicaea and why those all the religious figures gathered together at one point to discuss the nature of the Son of God. You know, and and to describe it, and it was from every possible conceivable perspective. You had your your just all of them were there, all of them had the scripture available, and then all of them hammered out what is called today an egregore, which is that psychic entity. And in order for it to exist, for you to cobble together the thing of the mind stuff, it must have rules. It must have parameters. We engage in the same function that that exists, um, that, that we inherit from the all. So as <clears throat> the all is mind and the universe is mental, and we exist within the mind of the all, within our minds, individually and collective, exist the gods. For we, in, we create for these forces of nature, which are always there, a personality that they can inhabit. And that personality then allows them to enliven the symbolic nature that they embody. So that each god has a series of animal totems or colors or behaviors or stories. And over time, you begin to realize that each culture is speaking often to the same life experiences or the same experiences with divinity. So Zeus and Odin can be seen as co-equal because of their nature as king of gods and things like that, as, as you can with other cultures that would also present a solitary divinity as being the king and that person throwing divine lightning bolts around and commanding thunder and storms in the air. All of those guys are probably the same person lens through a different cultural perspective. So as she continues, she says, um, success in the operation depends, of course, on the degree to which the worshiper can appreciate through sympathy the nature of the being he is bent upon invoking. As, as she continues on, she points out in the next section that um, if, as things wane and populations stop pumping energy into these things, then those divinities recede. And so, you know, today the meaning beyond name only of the god Zeus or Jupiter or Inani or Horus or uh, Quetzalcoatl or just any of these gods, because there's no one who's actually organizing a religious body with performances and sacrifices and consistent symbology relating to a narrative to give you the structure to draw that power to you personally. 
they've all vanished. They're an intellectual exercise until they're not. And, and the until they're not, which is where we are, is this in section 12. As long as the astral form is kept alive by the appropriate kind of worship carried out by worshipers who have necessary capacity to enter into the sympathetic communion with that kind of life, there is an incarnated God available for contacting. She continues, should worship cease, the God withdraws. Should other worshipers come along, she says further on, however, um, who possess the knowledge necessary to build a form in accordance with the nature of the life that is invoked and the imaginative sympathy necessary to invoke it, it is comparatively simple. It is a comparatively simple matter to attract into the form once more the life that was accustomed to ensoul it. Meaning that all that foundation work that our collective ancestry pumped into it over thousands of years as they worked with those entities, refined them, defined them, had them incorporated into their actual life, we can draw upon that essence for enlightenment at the very least when we consult which gods are presented in the tree of life as we work around. That's what they're there for. And the terms that we want to study them are, are in terms of what they do astrologically. These are astrological symbols. So what we're looking for isn't necessarily, um, it isn't necessarily their mythological duty, but how they are presented astrologically, how they interact with us on a personal subjective level. These then, th that is the reason why we do not see the gods presented as they are in the spheres on the paths, right? We have a subjective reality on the paths, a subjective experience that we embody as we walk from one sphere to the next. But then when we get to that sphere, it's like a, a base coach in baseball. You know, you get up there and then that coach is like, okay, you've made it to first base and this is what you need to do to, you know, and they inform you as to the relationship of what that base is about, what that sphere is about, and what is necessary then to leave on the path extending from it. We're going to talk more about that today in our advanced course when we discuss the devil card and how it extends from Hode into Tipperet. So it's it's a path that leads from the formative world into the creative world. And, and the conjunction there is the higher self. So it's pretty significant dialogue. But in this case, when we look at the, the spheres, ooh, a little drink here. Ooh. Oh, that's good. <laughs> it's apple cinnamon tea. Mm, perfect. <clears throat> okay. So in this case, when we're looking at each of the individual spheres, we're seeking to engage in communion with that divinity. And the best way to do it is to understand, is, is to approach the divinity on its terms. So when you enter, and and the, it's not, in, how do I say this? What we believe they are is less important than what the people who created them believed it is. So um, it, it's important to understand the period in which they were created, like how long ago, the kind of people that would have developed that divinity and, and why they would approach it at all. Because you have to remember that what we consider an in, the intellectual exercise of mythology today was day-to-day -day life for them. As significant as going to church on Sunday and worshiping Jesus or, or, or whatever else, you know, and, and, and consulting the Buddha, any modern religion. Like it, as much as we practice that today, they practiced it then. And we haven't changed. Like as people, 
in terms of how we approach religion. So the degree of faithfulness that you see among Christians and Muslims and, and Jews and Buddhists today is going to be probably the same level of faithfulness that you saw back in the day among Romans worshiping Jove and Juno, you know? Um, it, it certainly, you know, it, it's, or, or Catholics, you know, that, uh, it, it's just remember that also when something loses its value religiously, people will stop doing it. Like you just can't convince a person to keep offering sacrifice if they're not seeing anything significant on the back end. It's why religion has such a hard time, even today, holding people's attention because they're kind of waiting for that that communion, that spiritual payoff. And simply by doing a series of things often isn't enough to engage in the personal transformation or transmutation that is required, you know, to actually get that level of communion. Okay, so how are we doing so far? Any questions? Good? Okay, just wanted to pause just for a moment. Okay, we're going to pull that picture back up. So, we now have, in uh, when we look at the tree, there are, in fact, nine gods presented here, um, not ten. And that's because the, the tenth sphere, down here at the bottom, Malkut, that's, uh, that's the you are here button. You know, like uh, when you're in a mall, a shopping mall, and uh, treat this like a mall photograph. So that's the you are here button. And then each of the spheres are like different shops in your shopping mall. Actually, it's a pretty good analogy. So and and there are certain things, you know, you wouldn't, for instance, go and expect to find uh, hunting gear in a jewelry store. Mm -hmm. Right. So in the same sense, if I want to seek out a great hunter, let's say, then, you know, I probably would be working up here with Mars, right? This is often the guy who's the tactician. He's often associated with great hunters. Um, you know, if, if I want to talk to a great diplomat, I might seek out Jupiter, right? And, and that's simply because uh, astrologically speaking, this character's persona is one that's outgoing and you know uh, capable to negotiate and communicate and you'll find that if you use those subjective analogs and then realize that it's still about you <laughs> like all of this is still about you like when you're dealing with these gods it is your impression of them it's always your impression that's why it's always a personal relationship that you develop, whether it's with uh, Zeus or Venus or Apollo um, or uh, Hermes or if it's Jesus or the Buddha, the personal relationship comes from you actually understanding who you are relating to. So are the gods real? Yes and no. They definitely are real, and they definitely are the product of us creating a interface with a greater reality. <laughs> so, um, in one way, you could say <clears throat> in one way, you could say the gods are a program of living consciousness. So it is the descent of spirit into mind. Um, the full energy that is undefined into a structure that provides for that energy definition. It is the equivalent of when when you create a god when you create a god it is the equivalent of building a car but until you put gas into the car it goes nowhere so the god 
and the fluidity of the gasoline and its infernal nature, meaning that it's it's inflammatory. <clears throat> and uh, it, yeah, which relates it to carbon, uh, hydrocarbons and sulfur emissions. And anyway, the, the, the analogy in my head just keeps working. But when you take the car plus the fuel, now you have the vehicle that you can use and drive to take you places. So until then, you can only imagine where you can go, but you can't actually go anywhere. Once you provide for it the fuel, and, and this literally is one of those situations of if you build it, they will come. And, and by that, what is meant is if there is enough structure to it, it will, by virtue of its nature, draw the thing from the ether to it, like iron filings to a magnet. That's that's how that works. And it works in everything. It works in even, um, for instance, like the, the generation of the Loa in Voodoo or Santorini or any of these others. Um, it, and and uh, I had a friend of mine who actually showed me how to create little little puppets like little where you could inhabit smaller uh embers of the loa right so they blaze and they were fiery and they're these gods and from them the idea is uh, as as they illuminate <clears throat> that can be captured into a vessel and then given form or purpose right as long as it's defined and nurtured. And the more minds that are applying themselves to the definition and nurturing of this thing, this egregore, um, the stronger it gets. It's it's like reinforcing something. When, when you do it yourself, it's like building it with balsa wood and tissue paper. And it's very easy for it to become disrupted. As, as you incorporate a few people, you may find that that becomes even more disruptive because it's difficult to get a few people to agree. But surprisingly, there's a tipping point where a few becomes many. And at that point, then it, it goes back into singular group consciousness. And, and we see this with uh, individuals and then small groups and then mobs. And, and that's just how the human mind works. So with when you have a small group, there's still individuals trying to interrelate and it may be difficult, but then you get a large group and you've now got a church, right? You know, you know, in the millions, let's say, and now that that entity which is created is easily inhabited anytime the object of it is provided. It's for this reason, understanding this process is the reason why idolatry is so wrong. It's it's the core reason why I stopped reading tarot professionally, because no matter how much you try to explain to someone the, the cards aren't magical or what have you, they believe they are. And and they don't understand that they're just the car without the gas and, and the gas comes from someplace else. And if too much emphasis is placed on that car or they think the car in and of itself has power, the idol in and of itself has power, right? And then they break knee and fall before it and worship it by virtue of the fact they think that by doing that, it empowers the idol further. That's not the way that works. That's not how that works. The very fact that the person is kneeling before the idol is proof that they don't understand this process. Because they don't understand that the idol is like a cell phone. It's the, the, the signal is carried through the phone and interpreted by the phone so that we can understand it. And similarly, if I create a statue, the, the, the signal is that divine force, which is then put through that image. And contemplation of that image allows for interface with that force whether the force be something of strength, like in Gavura, or mercy, or communicative ability, or the ability to, you know, be a scoundrel, I don't know. 
um, the ability to understand love. Um, each of these are forces which are embodied within those spheres, and we can come to terms with them through an application of our understanding of the form that we've given it. I guess I can't really stress enough just that the idolatry is a really bad thing. Like, it's destructive. Um, and, and it is. It absolutely stops you. It, it, in terms of idolatry comes when the person is adamant that the gods are real. When their own mind demonstrates that they, there's uncertainty, that they'll never be certain, that it's impossible to be certain, and no amount of people telling you it's real will still make you certain because it's a personal thing. It's your personal interface. So if we collectively gather together and we say, okay, we agree that this interface is a good one. We like the principles that are embodied with it. We like the uh, emblematic nature of self-sacrifice and truthfulness and goodliness. And so, you know, you become Christian or whatnot or Catholic. And, and or you like the, the, the nature of the Buddha and the, the peaceful, you get me. The, if, if that's where you're at and we gather together, then our strength comes from each other, but it also comes from our focus upon a unified point of consciousness. Because we're all kind of, it, we, we share uh, agreed upon tendencies, which then form a gentle lattice work of our faith, right? It, it, so that you're, because if you don't have this really gentle lattice work, it, it describes this in other ways. If all you are is the force that comes from Netsik, and you don't have the in the intelligence or structure that is provided through mercury right these two ideas um then you're only getting half and the people that are adamant that the gods exist they find themselves lost amid this whole period phase of illusion it's like a dream state because they're right and yet they're wrong you know and and so because of their rightness they're able to self-affirm um because they exist under a pillar of mercy they're able surprisingly to blind themselves to the greater reality like there, there's just a number of things that take place when you dispense from the dualism that is expressed in the tree and polarized to just one side ignoring the other right nothing is monopolar in the tree at no point in the tree is anything monopolar it's it's always two poles um two ideas which then define the thing between them and simultaneously define the nature of the poles because what the one thing is the other is not therefore you can define what it is all right so how does one commune with the gods? The first step, like just in review, recognize the dualism of their nature. Recognize that communion is possible. Um, you have to make it personal. For me, um, <laughs> for me, it was to make friends with them. And, and in truth, I still, um, I have difficulty with some of the gods because of their story. Jupiter in particular is a really tough god for me to deal with on occasion, just because of the nature of the myths associated with Jupiter on multiple levels. I'll leave it to you guys to, to think about that, but Jupiter is considered a liar, and he's a thief, and he's had other things. The patron of thieves is in Hode, but there's a whole different reason for that. That's in Mercury. But Jupiter himself, through other myths, is, you know, not always the great and shining light. He's he's all over the, you know, just read up on Zeus, you know. Uh, Zeus wasn't always a pleasant individual. So, um, and, and you'll find that that feeling about them is only possible when it does become personal. When you recognize them, you recognize the force that has been behind them 
and realize that, you know, on an abstract level, it's just, you know, this idea for me. On an abstract level, it's just this idea. But then on a personal subjective level, you almost time travel in consciousness because it is all unified. And so you bridge this enormous gap when you begin to see it through the eyes of our ancestors recognize you know the significance of a sacrifice that is made to these guys uh, these gods recognize the significance of an entire culture that is built around them that that material industry is structured and built around them realize that that enforcement that power has been so so informative so strong to us as people that the very days of the week are named after these gods like which means that each day as we step in from one day to the next a day being a god that's latin for god then then as we go from one god to the next we have an opportunity to to commune on literally a daily basis to to make that you know like instead of your word of the day hey i'm going to learn just a little bit more about the god of today you know and and so when looking at it sunday is obviously the sun monday is the moon tuesday this is a bit of an extension but you'll understand why later this relates to god uh tear and uh so therefore it is Mer uh, mars i'm sorry wednesday we understand through an understanding of french mercury um, mercury day so wednesday is in the middle and when we talked about um, uh, Mercury and its application toward the, the principle of gender, that makes sense because the one side is facing the sun and the other side is facing out toward darkness, which is Saturn, right? So putting Wednesday as Mercury in the middle of the week, Thursday, that's that's Jupiter Day, um, or UD, which uh, again, French informs us of that. Um, Friday, this is Venus Day, Vendredi, and then uh, Saturday is Saturday, Saturn Day. So you get your seven days a week right there. And remember, we talked about how Saturn uh, can be seen as representative of the supernal triangle. So there you have it. Um, Saturn concludes the week and Sunday begins the week or depending on where you are in the world, because other people conclude their week on Friday or, or, you know, anyway. So, but nevertheless, these days of the week are points of human consciousness that are still impactful to us. Um, and, and so it behooves us to understand the, the fullness of that impact and then realize that because we have the days of the week, the scaffolding, the the bare bones of the bridge that will take us from here to there has never gone away. It's never been fully neglected, which means that we can commune on each of these days if we purposefully begin to focus on each of the gods as presented within the tarot or within the tree of life, the exception being Uranus and Pluto, which is number two and number one. We'll talk about those guys later, but uh, for now, that's it. That's your introductory broad stroke sweep of the gods of the tarot. Couldn't help it. <laughs>